Hello, org officers. Thank you so much for joining me for the first sold workshop of the semester. My name is Lisa, and I'm the coordinator of student organizations here at UNT. Today, we're going to discuss communication, specifically how important it is to effectively communicate as a student leader, whether that's communicating with fellow org officers, org members, or even your advisor. The objectives today are to learn the types of communication and their importance, barriers that we face with verbal communication, hardships that come along with verbal communication, and then finally, we're going to discuss how verbal communication looks for student leaders and how to strengthen our skills. So there's four types of communication, verbal, nonverbal, visual, and written. Visual is not always included, but it's important to consider. Examples of what each of those types of communication are on the right hand side of the screen. We also have various levels of verbal communication. So we have interpersonal, which restricts ourselves and includes the silent conversations that we have, how we process thoughts and actions. We can then choose to share it verbally or keep it confined as a thought. Interpersonal takes place between two individuals, one-on-one -on -one communication where there are two individuals who swap their roles of sender and receiver of the communication. Small groups are more than two people, and it's still small enough for each member to interact with the rest. Public is where one individual addresses a large gathering of people. There's usually a single sender of information and several receivers. Importance. In this video, we will learn what communication is. We will also learn the importance of communication and ways to improve our communication skills to have better personal and professional relationships. Talking is an integral part of living. We talk to our family members, friends, people at work, and even strangers. But do we really communicate with them? Let's see how communication is different from talking. Talking simply refers to speaking words and sentences. Sometimes the message is understood, Sometimes it is not. Communicating is one step further in the process. It is the sharing of information between two or more people to reach a common understanding. Communication is a two-way process. It needs a sender or a speaker and a receiver or a listener. The speaker's role is to speak clearly, while the listener's role is to pay attention to the speaker. However, quite often, people focus more on what they want to say rather than listen to others. Now, before we understand the importance of communication, let's imagine a day without speaking to anyone. How would you find it? Difficult? Boring? Communication is the basis of all relationships. We communicate with others for many reasons. For example, when you can't find your clothes, you reach out to your mother or father. We also need to talk to others to share our joys and sorrows with them. At work, we talk to our co-workers to share ideas, exchange information and seek help from them. Without communication, our life would come to a standstill. We communicate not just verbally, but also non-verbally through our body language and facial expressions. Another mode of communication is written, which includes letters, emails, notes, etc. To make sure we talk and write effectively and that our audience gets the message, we must follow the seven C's of communication. Let's see what these are. Be clear. When writing or speaking to someone, be clear about your message. Think what your purpose is in communicating with another person. If you're not sure, then your audience won't be either. Be concise. Keep your message short and to the point. Make sure your message is concrete and gives your audience a clear picture of what you want to say. Be correct. Correct communication is error-free and uses language that is understood by others. Be coherent. Coherent communication is logical. 
It means that all points are connected to the main topic and follow the correct order or sequence. Your message should be complete. After reading or listening to your message, others should know what is to be done. Finally, be courteous. Use respectful and polite language at all times. Now, let's look at a conversation to see how an unclear message can confuse others. Hello, doctor. My right leg has been paining since yesterday. All right, let me check. Well, you have got sciatica. I'll write down some analgesics for your inflammation and proceed from there based on your body's response. What? I don't understand. Is it serious? Will I be fine? Am I going to die? You'll be fine. Just take these medicines. Um, all right. I don't know what he's saying. I think I should speak to some other doctor. I don't trust this doctor. Do you think this communication was effective? What made it fail? There are many barriers to communication, and these may occur at any stage in the communication process. They lead to misunderstanding and wasted time. The use of overcomplicated or unfamiliar language is a common barrier to communication. Here, the doctor used difficult medical terms that the patient did not understand. This left him confused, nervous, and unsure. Our emotions also affect our communication. How we interpret what we hear is affected by the thoughts that come to our mind when we are listening. For example, if your boss asks if the task that was assigned to you has been completed and you interpret it as the boss blaming you for not completing the task, you are likely to respond in anger. However, if you interpret the message as your boss just wanting to know the status, you are likely to feel less angry and defensive. Distraction and lack of interest also affects understanding. We filter information based on what we want to hear. For example, when our manager is assigning work, we only listen to those which we need to do. Remember, developing effective communication skills means improving both your speaking and listening skills. Even if you are not born with these skills, you can develop them by paying attention to what and how you say things and listening attentively to others. All right, so let's have a discussion about what we just learned in that video. Feel free to pause the video so that you can answer all of these questions. First, let's think about what type of communication do you prefer to use or find yourself using the most often? So we're looking at, do you use verbal, nonverbal, visual, written? What is the most common type of communication that you prefer? Next, think about the level of communication. So what level of communication do you feel the most comfortable with? Intrapersonal, interpersonal, small group, and public. Third, how do you strive to communicate effectively within your organizations? And then finally, think about what changes can you make in the way that you currently communicate to make it more effective? We are going to talk about verbal communication barriers and how they can jam up an otherwise helpful discussion. We are especially focusing on group discussions, but this is applicable to almost all conversations. And we are working out of Bibi and Masterson's book on communicating in small groups. I'll put a link to their book in the description below the video. So let's get into those details. So the key point is that verbal communication choices, your choices will directly influence the results of your conversations, whether you're a participant or a leader. It's especially true though for leaders. Language can directly affect a group's effectiveness. In fact, there was a study by Mayfield and Mayfield in 2015 that showed a 10% increase in the leader's use of motivating language resulted in a 2.5% increase in the quality of the follower's decision-making. So here's what that means. As the leader used more deliberately motivating language, 
followers' decision-making improved. There's a measurable difference. In other words, your language choices, especially as a leader, but even as participants, changes the outcome. So it's really important that we get serious about the way we communicate and talk and be careful and thoughtful about what we say. And we're going to look at barriers that you can hear yourself say possibly and make sure you try to get rid of. So the first common barrier, word barrier, is bypassing. Very common. Bypassing is when two people assign different meanings to the same word. There are lots of words that can be understood in a variety of ways. Now think about just this quick sample I thought of. Love, romance, quality, health, serious, soon. Like just the word soon. If I say that'll be done soon, that may mean something to me in my head. And you may have a completely different understanding of what the word soon means. So if I use words like this without clarifying, then that could be a bypassing issue that we are experiencing. Like you said soon, well, I did get it to you soon. And then you have a big argument about this. This happens in interpersonal relationships and friendships and marriages. And it certainly happens in the workplace. I see it all the time happen. In fact, there was a study done that showed that the 500 most frequently used words in the English language have more than 14,000 dictionary definitions. So I don't have a monopoly on what the correct understanding of a word is. We have to work that out. So a possible fix to this is feedback. So if somebody says something to you and maybe it's a little ambiguous, you can double check it with them. You can ask them, is this what you mean? And you can do the same if you're the one speaking. You want to ask them a question to see if they're understanding. So a little back and forth feedback just for a few moments can really make sure you avoid this allness word barrier, this bypassing word barrier, excuse me. The next one is allness. Number two, allness is where we make simple but untrue generalizations. This is really common. You hear this all the time, especially about genders. I don't know why, but some people would say things like, oh, women are smarter than men. That's a huge allness or generalization statement, or athletes aren't good students. I've heard this so many times. I teach college and they say, well, athletes don't make good students. Most of my athletes have been outstanding students, very hard workers. I just don't find it to be true. I don't find it to hold up. But it doesn't stop people from making these big generalizations. So allness can be a huge word barrier, a big verbal communication barrier, because it reinforces stereotypes. And essentially, it takes away possible common ground that you could have with the other speaker, the other listener. So what you want to do as a possible fix is to qualify your statements and be specific. Many situations are unique and you don't want to generalize everything too hastily. Number three, a fact inference confusion. In fact, I may make a whole separate video on this. This is a big one. That's when someone responds to something as if they have actually observed it. It's a fact in other words, but the reality is they just have drawn a conclusion about it. So let's say I saw someone that I know that I'm already feeling a little weird or paranoid about walking through my building. I might draw the conclusion, oh, that person's snooping around. So the fact is they walked to the building. My inference is they were snooping around. They were spying on us. Uh, I, have, I know someone who makes the, these kinds of generalizations sometimes. And I think, you know, that's maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's more to it. And the, the fact is they walked to the building. You were jumping to a conclusion that they're snooping around. So this happens when people speculate about or interpret what they think occurred, but state it as if it's a verified certainty. He'll destroy our country. That's probably been said about almost every person that's ever, every man anyway, who's ever run for president in the last few decades. He'll destroy our country. Like it's an absolute certainty, even though the country hasn't been completely destroyed yet. So a possible fix for this is to Practice and double check recognizing the difference. So as you hear yourself talk, recognize, am I making a jump in logic here? Am I jumping too far based on what I observed? Uh, don't state things definitively if you haven't observed the actual thing. So some key learning points here is that give more thought to how we make statements. Hear yourself say it before you say it. Make, make a decision. Is this how I want to come across? Use feedback to double check your understanding in a situation and to make sure you have common ground and practice reflecting on the facts before you make jumps in conclusion. So question of the day, where do you hear yourself in any of these? Do you make these kinds of 
errors when you're communicating? Do you have any kind of word barriers like these that come up in your conversations? Typically, we do have difficulty misunderstanding each other in conversations, and these three verbal word barriers are often the culprit. I would love to hear your comments, your feedback in that section below the video. Thanks, and I will see you soon. All right, so let's discuss what we learned in this video. Which type of bar barriers mentioned in the video do you find yourself using when communicating with others? What are some practical ways to change that language to promote better communication? And then finally, how can you, as a student leader, keep from creating verbal communication barriers? All right, and then just kind of to recap what we've learned today, the importance of effective communication. So it increases productivity, the morale and retention in your student org or just in day-to-day -day life is higher when you have effective communication. You don't miss opportunities where there might be a communication barrier or something that was lost in translation. And it also increases the credibility of you and your org. If you're able to com communicate effectively, you're able to get more done, there's more that is able to be accomplished as an org or as a person. So that's all great things. That's what really is important about effective communication. And then some final questions that we can reflect on from today's presentation are, what are you taking with you? What did you learn? Um, was it helpful? Think about the ways that you communicate with others and other org members. Is that effective? What personal changes need to be made? And in what setting are you comfortable communicating? Where can you approve as a communicator? Thank you so much for joining me today on this old workshop about communication. We'd love to hear your feedback if you thought that this was helpful, if there's any way that we can continue to help with communication amongst you and your org members or fellow officers, please feel free to reach out and let us know. If you have an idea for a sold workshop that you think would be really beneficial to you and fellow org officers, please let us know. You can always contact us either by phone, we're in Union 345, or you can send us an email. Um, but thank you so much.